Hello all, and welcome to yet another episode of Real History. I am history professor Jared Frederick, and we're glad that you can join us for yet another segment where we explore how the past is conveyed through film. And I'm very excited for the segment that we will be initiating tonight because, in fact, we will be taking a look at all 10 episodes of the acclaimed HBO series Band of Brothers. This was a film that I first saw when I was in high school, and like so many other people, I was immediately captivated by it. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to do a lot more research in depth, and it's really given me a whole lot of fresh, and new perspectives on not only this acclaimed film, but the stories behind it as well. And so this will be the first of 10 episodes in which we examine Band of Brothers. And I think we'll be in for quite a ride and hopefully with a lot of good insights along the way. So let's go ahead and begin Band of Brothers, Episode 1, Curahy. We're in a store, and a guy in that store told us to put our uniforms on. Uh, what the hell are you talking about? Right off the bat, Band of Brothers is rooted in this historical realism thanks to the very personal veteran interviews that begins each episode. And there's a sort of collective anonymity to all of these men. You know that they are characters in the film, but you don't know who they are. You don't find that out until the very last episode of the series. And so there's an air of mystery to these gray-haired men reminiscing about their past. And it also adds a little bit of suspense as you're watching the film itself, because you're wondering, who are these characters in real life? Who lives? Who dies? It's a really interesting formula, right out of the gate. It's a very interesting cinematic choice to begin in a pottery England two days before D-Day. Naturally, this is a historical event that viewers are we're already familiar with. Uh, but it really sets the stage about what is at stake, the imminent threat and the imminent danger that these paratroopers would find themselves in. And I think perhaps the, the film would have embarked with a very different tone had it immediately initiated with stateside training. So probably a wise choice on the part of the filmmakers. Channel Coast is socked in with rain and fog. High winds on the drop zone. No jump tonight. D-Day was originally scheduled for June 5th, 1944, but there was a sudden surge of inclement weather that was sweeping over the channel. And Dwight Eisenhower made the very drastic yet important decision to delay the invasion by 24 hours. And it was hoped that on June 6th there would be a small window of opportunity before some of the foul weather returned. And so it was a true roll of the dice. The clock was ticking, and everybody realized it. And here we are introduced to the spine of the story, Lieutenant Dick Winters. Winters was a rather quiet officer from old Mennonite stock in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. He enlisted in the peacetime army in 1941 and I imagine he's one of very few American officers in the Second World War who went from the rank of private to major in just three or four years' time. It's a really incredible feat. A couple of drinks, maybe an early dinner before the theater. The man with winners here in these scenes in camp, a hard-drinking Ivy Leaguer by the name of Lieutenant Lewis Nixon. These two men were very dissimilar from one another. Uh, one of them was a bit of a party animal. The other one was uh, a little bit more uh, traditional and reserved. Dick Winters considered himself in his youth to be a, a still wallflower. 
And uh, despite their incredible personal differences, these two men really uh, struck it off uh, because they were really driven by a lot of the same convictions in regard to the notions of their military service. And they formed a steadfast friendship out of that as a result. Camp Tekoa was established in the summer of 1942 for the newly formed 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Uh, that is when uh, the 506th uh, went there. And it was pretty much this ramshackle camp. It had about a dozen or so rows of barracks. And, you know, it was full of red clay, rats, mosquitoes. It was humid. Uh, it was certainly not a picturesque or pleasant environment. And the, the discomfort of Camp Tekoa, uh, originally called Camp Tombs, uh, was underscored by the very strict physical regimen that these would-be paratroopers had to take. And for the men of Easy Company within the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, all of these problems were even further compounded by a rather hard-nosed lieutenant, a commanding officer by the name of Herbert Sobel, here played by actor David Schwimmer. Rust on the butt plate, hinge spring, private bullshit, revoked. Name. At the time of the filming of Band of Brothers, David Schwimmer was the best known actor in it because of his role in the popular TV show Friends. But many actors would subsequently uh, elevate in their star status as a result of this series. Every man in the company who had a weekend pass has lost it. Change into your PT gear, we're running Curahee. Curahee was a 1,200 foot mountain that stood over Camp Tekoa. And as the common saying was among the paratroopers, it was three miles up, three miles down. And on average, these paratroopers could run up Curahee in 45 minutes. And if it took you a lot longer than that, you were going to be kicked out of the regiment and rotated onto a non-paratrooper unit. I asked you a question, Private. Easy Company veteran Bill Garnier later said of incidents like this that one of the primary missions of the strictness of Camp Tekoa was to weed out the weaklings. Uh, something like 6,000 aspiring paratroopers entered through the gates of Camp Tekoa trying to gain that prestigious standing of paratrooper and 80% of them would be kicked out, quit, or turned away. And so this really was the cream of the crop. These were men who aspired to be the absolute best in a brand new component of the U.S. Army. Dick Winters prodded himself on being able to run Curahee in 44 minutes. He said uh, one of the record times in the company was 42 minutes, uh, but on average it was about 45, 46 minutes. Uh, Dick Winters said that uh, he was no runner, he just plodded along. Those were some of his words. Uh, and of course, for most of the rest of us, it's really astounding when you think of it, the, the, the rate and the speed at which these men moved up and down this imposing mountain. Ah, Lieutenant. Poor. A young Michael Fassbender we see here before he hits the big time. In hindsight, veterans of Easy Company have very mixed emotions about Herbert Sobel. A lot of them perceived him as this uh, petty, uh, commandeering, inflexible commander who was almost sinister in nature, that he enjoyed inflicting misery on his men. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that his 
unbending demeanor strengthened Easy Company for their very difficult tasks ahead. And it was their trials at Camp Tekoa that prepared them for even more grueling missions ahead. So two very different interpretations on the pros and cons of Herbert Sobel. Sobel's a genius. I had a headmaster just like him in prep school. I know the type. Was... Paratroopers earned $50 extra per month as quote hazardous duty pay and this was seen as an incentive to attract uh, more potential recruits to the paratroops uh, simply because it was so dangerous. Uh, the, the likelihood that you would hurt yourself amidst training, that you would break an ankle, break a leg, mess up your back, even before you cross the Atlantic to go to Europe, um, the probability was high. Jesus, what the hell is this? Oh, that's big, guys, boy. What we see in this scene here, uh, crawling through all the muck, this was known as the hog innards problem. And it was exactly what it appeared to be. Uh, it was pig entrails scattered throughout um, a system of uh, very shallow trenches, about 15 or 18 inches high. And oftentimes there were 30 caliber machine guns firing over the men as they were crawling through that muck as well. And all of that was meant to uh, mentally and emotionally prepare them for the rather gruesome circumstances that they would encounter in the European theater. The name Kurahi supposedly derives from a Cherokee word meaning standalone, and the 506th Regiment altered that meaning a little bit to the idea of we stand alone, that we stand alone together, uh, that when we are together we are in fact one. And that sums up the idea of Band of Brothers perhaps more than anything else. All weekend passes are canceled, officers included. Carry on. Winners often remained on base, even during weekends when other soldiers may have had passes. And what he did is that he studied, he read, he uh, scrutinized and very heavily studied infantry journals, manuals. He, was, he knew what was ahead and he was preparing accordingly. As a test of your organizational skills and command potential, I am designating you mess officer. Some suggest that Winners was put in charge of the company mess because Sobel viewed him as this internal threat who perhaps uh, defied or undermined his authority and putting him in the kitchen was a way of getting Winners out of the way, if you will. And as a result, Winners felt like he was somewhat of a pariah, like he was an outcast. This is not what he anticipated when he in, uh, joined the paratroops. Um, and so it would be a little bit of a struggle, sometimes contentious, uh, to get back where he wanted to be. Training at Tekoa lasted 13 weeks, but uh, additional training was also extended at Fort Benning, and that is where uh, many of the men actually received their jump wings. So, um, in some cases, certainly, the film has to condense things in the name of fitting the storyline into a single episode. So do we feel like we're ready to be Army paratroopers? Yes, sir. And notice that these paratroopers are actually wearing football helmets. Um, in many war movies, they may have overlooked, you know, something uh, that was so uh, simplistic and minuscule in the costume design. But, you know, it's little things like that that is a real testament to a lot of the research that was put into Band of Brothers. Uh, the veterans received 
surveys during the pre-production of this film where they could outline what uniform components they wore and when they wore it. Um, and so there was a real effort made to work with the veteran community to add as much authenticity to this as possible. Well, at ease, paratroopers. Good Colonel Robert Sink was the regimental commander of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment. Uh, he was in his late 30s at the time, and by those standards, he was considered an old man. Uh, but he had no problem keeping up with people who were almost 20 years younger than he was. And he never expected his troopers to do anything that he himself could not achieve. Um, and so he may have been years older, uh, but from a stamina standpoint, uh, it seemed that he was as young as the men he commanded. Sobel, just talking about that. So, he gets a little jumpy in the field. Mm -hmm. He gets jumpy and then you get killed. This was one of the great fears about Captain Sobel, that his apparent skittishness and uncertainty during war games would later on spiral into something even more drastic once these men actually found themselves in the combat zone. And at one point, you know, uh, Winters overheard or was involved in conversations where men were saying, Jesus Christ, we're supposed to follow this guy into battle? And it, it just seemed that, you know, right from the outset here, that there was a lack of trust. And for war correspondents like Ernie Pyle, who was a, a very accurate recorder of the GI experience in World War II, he said that 90% of a unit's effectiveness is rooted in unit pride and confidence in unit leadership. Easy Company had plenty of confidence in themselves, but that confidence was not matched in their leader. Dear sir or madam. The regiment traveled on a vessel that was known as the SS Samaria. And as we see here in this scene, they were really kind of packed in there like sardines. And uh, David Webster, one of the, the privates in the regiment, uh, wrote a letter home to his nephew um, describing all of uh, the, the, the sights and sounds and particularly the smells that emanated from the deep bowels of this ship as these hundreds and hundreds of men were packed in there. And, uh, you know, he suggested that if his nephew ever found himself in a situation like this, it's always a really good idea to bring your own soap and towel um, on journeys as such. So uh, a little bit of dark humor there uh, from this transatlantic voyage. Luckily for the ship, uh, they encountered uh, fairly calm seas, and they also did not encounter, you know, any enemy U-boats or anything like that. So it could have even been a more tumultuous journey along the way. How do you know he's a Quaker? He ain't Catholic. Neither Sobel. That freaks the son of Abraham. He's what? Sobel's he's faith is actually up to debate. Um, some people said he was Jewish. Other. Uh, others have claimed that he was, in fact, Roman Catholic. Um, that may be a liberty that was taken by the film to perhaps create more friction. Um, I'm not altogether sure what his actual religious affiliation was. The paratroopers trained with every sort of weapon imaginable, not only from their own army, but they often used uh, captured German weapons as well, then if they found themselves in a desperate situation as such, they would know how to use the enemy's instruments of war against him. There should be no, there should be no fence here. Um, <clears throat> we, we could go over it, sir. Really? That's not the point! We're Another future famous actor, Simon Pegg, Shaun of the Dead, acting as uh, Sobel's sergeant here. Who said that? Who broke silence? I think it's Major Horton, sir. 
the funny thing about this scene, not only is it comedic in its own right, um, but Major Horton is a, a real life character who is continuously referenced throughout the series, but is never actually seen by the audience. Uh, and so that makes this uh, little bit of a comedic escape even more comical. These sort of encounters with the British populace also happened rather frequently. Uh, it was not uncommon for uh, you know, British women who were milking the cows in the morning to suddenly be ambushed by a scurry of paratroopers who were running across lanes or meadows. And as uh, one British woman said, they often gave us quite a fright. Winners, uh, in fact, uh, resided with a local British couple by the name of uh, the Barnes family. And uh, they are among the many characters who are omitted from Band of Brothers. And it, it really offered winners a home away from home. Uh, the Barnes family had lost their son earlier in the war, and uh, winners kind of served as a, a temporary replacement son. And they really made him feel at home. And he reciprocated that sort of uh, affection by helping them around the house, cutting the grass. Um, and it, it really uh, symbolized the, the level of uh, comedy and friendship that was often expressed between the Americans and the British during this time of transition, which the British still refer to as the friendly invasion, the friendly invasion of Yanks. My endorsement, sir. I request trial by court-martial. This court-martial actually did happen, and it was part of a, a long-standing uh, series of animus interactions that Winters and Sobel had with one another, and it, it all culminated in this. And uh, Winters suspected that Sobel was trying to gig him, as Winters would later say in his letters. And it was a very minuscule, trivial offense where uh, Sobel purportedly changed the time of a latrine inspection and uh, Winters did not get word of it. I'm losing easy company. War if it needs you elsewhere. One could make the argument that Herbert Sobel never really recovered from easy company being taken away from him. He remained in the service in the 101st. He saw combat. He earned the combat infantry badge. But he never attended a reunion after the war. He was always invited. He never responded. At one point, he attempted to take his own life. He was blinded as a result. And uh, he, by and large, lived his final years um, in a state of loneliness and isolation. The really weird part about it is that he died the exact same day that I was born. Never put yourself in a position where you can take from these men. Dick Winters is very much taking on this fatherly, kind of almost paternalistic role um, in regard to his easy company duties, and that will only grow as the show progresses. Look, on the last training jump, I had a compass. Close the flap. Here we are introduced to Lieutenant Thomas Meehan, and he was Herbert Sobel's replacement. Meehan was a, a far more kindly officer, kind of this uh, gentle fellow from Philadelphia. And prior to the invasion, he had perhaps a premonition of his own fate that he would write to his wife about. And uh, perhaps we'll see in some of the forthcoming scenes if that premonition becomes reality. Each trooper will learn this operation by heart and know his and every other outfit's mission to the detail. Lieutenant Meehan? Yes, Dukeman. This sort of preparation was absolutely vital. 
um, as troopers studied sand tables, kind of these mock-up dioramas that were created uh, to replicate the Normandy terrain, this study was uh, vital uh, because as many of them inevitably would become lost in the, the boggy, saturated Normandy meadows, they would bring to mind those sand tables that they had studied in order to connect the geographic dots that would help them to reach their ultimate destination. Hey, TNT, this bullshit, and a pair of nasty skivvies. What's your point? You know, they stuck ways as much as I do. I still got my shoot, my reserve shoot, my May West, my M1. The frustration here was real. Many of these paratroopers had in excess of 100 or 110 pounds when they would leap from these C-47s on D-Day. Uh, as is often the case in military history, uh, these men were padded down like pack mules. And for many of them, that could have very lethal consequences. You're en route to the great adventure for which you have trained for over two years. That's why they gave us ice cream. These paratroopers were fed really well in the days prior to the invasion. They were getting uh, steak and eggs and mashed potatoes and green beans and ice cream. And of course, a lot of them saw it as, you know, essentially the last supper um, that they were being fatted before the slaughter. These days before the invasion were actually marked by a comparative calm in contrast to the very demanding training and uh, physical training um, that had been done in the, the weeks and months prior. And uh, even a few hours before they embarked on their D-Day adventure, uh, men were watching movies in tents and buildings, much like we see here in this scene. Um, many of the men treated the coming of the invasion rather nonchalantly because it's what they had trained for and it was what they had anticipated all along. You'll notice the, the cardboard side uh, sign that is uh, wrapped around uh, Dick Winters' neck. Um, that indicates stick 67. And a stick was uh, usually a platoon or so of paratroopers who were designated to a specific C-47 airplane. And so stick 67, those are the men who are going to be jumping out of a C-47 airplane that is designated just for them. Gentlemen, Doc Rowe is handing these out for air sickness. Orders are every man takes one now, another 30 minutes in the air. These air sickness pills infamously made people drowsy and that is why so many of the paratroopers actually fell asleep uh, during their airborne journeys across the channel. Dick Winters later wrote that he was uh, the last one to put on his gear uh, because he realized that his men who were encumbered by 100 plus pounds of equipment were going to need uh, assistance and mounting the three steps going up into the C-47. And uh, that is why we see him here uh, not as heavily equipped as the men he is helping to pull up off the ground. The men boarding the aircraft actually happened uh, late at night on June 5th, but because of the, the long English summers, you know, it was practically daylight until 10.30, you know, at, in the, at night. Um, and so this is actually much later than what it would suggest or seem to perhaps some of us watching the film in the United States. You'll notice the black and white stripes painted on the wings and the fuselages of these planes. And those were known as zebra stripes. Uh, these were painted on rather haphazardly just days prior to the invasion. And they were affixed onto the aircraft in order to avert friendly fire 
from uh, later on American ground forces and also the Allied Navy. It became a, uh, a visual bearing that would allow Allied service members on the ground or at sea to distinguish enemy aircraft from friendly aircraft. In this particular air armada, if memory serves correctly, there were something like 700 airplanes. You could only imagine the thundering roar that could be heard as these aircraft just sort of uh, billowed through the, the fleecy clouds over the English Channel. And uh, meanwhile, as we see here, there's something like over 5,000 ships uh, steaming ahead in the English Channel, heading toward the ultimate destination in Normandy. And at the very end here, we see Dwight Eisenhower's order of the day that he issued for the invasion. And he used this very strong and profound moral rhetoric to remind all of those allied soldiers, sailors, and airmen that they were involved in a great crusade, a mission that was bigger than themselves. And it's certainly a fitting note to end. So that concludes our uh, first segment, analyzing HBO's Band of Brothers. Uh, it offers a very good depiction of stateside training and also the transition that American service members had to make once they found themselves in England. And of course, the, the clock was ticking ever closer to an unknown date on which D-Day would fall. And that is what we will examine in the next episode of Band of Brothers, Day of Days. We'll see you then.